Thanks for tuning in to Harvesting Maine, an interview series brought to you by Real Maine on behalf of the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. Today, we're talking about plants in episode two. We'll meet some of the growers and businesses who provide some of these lovely products available this time of year in springtime, and we'll learn about the efforts that they put in year round to make sure we have beautiful plants surrounding our farms, working landscapes, and homes and communities every time that you drive by, walk by, or simply enjoy what's around Maine. Let's meet our interviewees. Well, welcome everyone. Tom, let's get started with you. It's been a pretty busy year. You've just come off one of the greatest years ever, perhaps, for people growing interest in gardening and nurseries. What did you do today? Well, <laughs> what didn't I do today? Uh, you know, in the month of May, basically, you juggle all day. So this morning, I started off at about 6 a.m. watering about half an acre of greenhouses. Um, by 9.30, we were pulling orders for wholesale in our Kennebunk store to ship out. By 11 o'clock, we were stocking shelves at the retail garden centers, uh, you know, benches. And by 1.30, 2 o'clock, we started potting about 10,000 uh, four and a half inch pots to finish out the day. So pretty, pretty crazy day. I think you're muted, Ann. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> All in a day's work, as I said. Uh, let's move on to Jennifer and Scott, uh, cut flower growers in kind of South Central Maine, if you will. Uh, Jennifer and Scott, thanks for joining us. Tell us about your how your day went. What'd you do today? Well, great, thank you for having us. I'm Jennifer, this is my husband, Scott, and we own and operate Eastern River Farm in Pittston, right outside of Augusta. And uh, we are in our third season here on this property. We've got 20 acres. We do about two to three acres of cut flowers. We focus on wedding design, so we do harvest uh, grow, harvest, and arrange for weddings um, for retail customers. We also have a large grocery account along the East Coast with 85 stores that we try to service as much as we can, and some local stores as well, and a small local bouquet subscription. And we also try to get flowers to designers when they, when they need them, since it's great to keep that local. We focus on um, difficult to find varieties, heirloom and fragrant flowers. We grow everything from bulbs and corms and tubers like um, tulips, ranunculus, uh, peonies, to the cup flower varieties that we plant from seed, such as lisianthus, Iceland poppies, zinnias, foxglove, delphinium, um, tons of sweet peas because we love the vines and the fragrance. And we just try to keep really colorful and fun. Uh, many brides like that blush and white color palette, champagne, peach, really um, delicate, pale color palette. But we also love when they like those bright saturated tones and the textural things as well. So today we've just been planting because of this awesome weather. We've been having, oh God, I think we've done 70 rows to like a half an acre already. And it's not even May 21st. So it's really good. Um, usually we can't even get the tractor on the fields by the middle of May safely and we've got half of our crops in already so it's looking to be a really great year. Excellent and it has been a beautiful day today if, if you are not from Maine and you're tuning in we've been pretty excited for this awesome burst of spring colors and um I'd like to take a moment and see what some folks just a little more north of you have been doing. Um, Marie, tell us what's been going on um, on your lavender farm today. Well, we started off at 6 a.m. this morning also, um, and we are establishing uh, about a half an acre of a new lavender field where um, Sweet Dreams is located in St. Albans. Um, we've been doing this since 2003, and now we're um, actually planting our own variety called Evelina. Um, so it started off at 6 a.m., um, getting the rocks and everything that's needed to do the fields. We've planted um, probably about 250 plants. 
Um, we also planted over a hundred uh, Eldevitz grapes. Um, so it was quite a busy day today. <laughs> Thanks, Marie. So we've got um, an herb garden coordinator and when we bring Signe on, I would love you all to learn a little bit more about uh, Signe's day in the life. And Signe has actually been working at a place that you all might have heard of before, but may not know a little bit uh, much in detail. So Signe, tell us what your day was like today. Yeah, I can definitely walk you through that. So I work out at the Sabbath Day Lake Shaker Village as one of the herb garden coordinators out here. And we sit on 1,800 acres of farm and forested land. And so I work with a small staff here. I'm not a shaker myself, but I work with the three last living shakers. And the, short, uh, the small staff that we have out here helps manage just the day-to-day -day operations of this fully functioning farm. Um, a day, so for example, I'll walk you through just uh, a day would be, we had the Fiddlehead School, which is a school in New Gloucester come out, third graders that would come out, that come out in the morning. They do an activity with Brother Arnold in the barn with the sheep, as we have a, a big, large uh, flock of sheep, as, long, as well as Highland cattle. And then they'll come up to the herb gardens for a little bit and they'll do some work in the herb gardens. Uh, as we have school groups that come in or volunteer groups that come in in the morning, we'll then have a period where my uh, coworker, Allie Armstrong, who's an herbalist who also works in the herb gardens with me, will we'll do some planting in the afternoon. Uh, as as others are saying, it's it's an early planting season for sure. So we're really working on getting some of the seedlings in the ground. And we do the seedlings here on site under grow lights. And we also have partnerships now with the New Gloucester High School and the Portland um, Art and Techno, uh, Technical School Paths uh, in Portland that help us with our seedlings. And so we'll do some afternoon planting um, if the weather cooperates like today. And now, right now I'm with you and my coworker Allie is actually at the Yarmouth Farmer's Market with some of our early fresh herbs, as well as all of our dried herbs from last season and dried floral bouquets from last season. So she's there now. And then our director, Michael, is actually, I wish I could show you and just turn the camera around, um, but he's up with our sheep manure, kind of turning that into some of um, some new plots that he tilled out this year. Uh, so the day is still very much happening for us um, with the farmer's market going on right now and Michael up in the fields and me with, with all of you. I think that's a good point. Um, not to mention everybody, the day is still happening and I really appreciate you all taking time. We're coming into really the height of spring in Maine. We're at the tippy top of New England and if you haven't been here uh, this time of year, we promise the scenery is worthwhile and I mean, you can deal with the bugs too. So, and perhaps some of you have dealt with that in different ways. Um, Tom, I know you manage a couple of large uh, familiar greenhouses. And sometimes when people think about plants, they think about bugs, um, but maybe not in the same way that we're talking about mosquitoes, black flies, or ticks, but you might use like beneficial insects. Are you using those in your greenhouse and nurseries? We use um, an IPM approach, so integrated pest management. So um, everything from nematodes to uh, beneficials are part of our program. Um, it's a multi-pronged approach. So um, nematodes have, have really made a big difference on one of our major pests, which are thrips. And a lot of homeowners don't really understand what thrips are and, and how they affect plants. Uh, you know, they will riddle, but they also will transmit a lot of disease, um, like imp impatient necrotic wilt virus and, and some others. So it's important for us to get those nematodes down, um, which not only does it kill them when they're on the plants, but it also kills them when they're in the soil, um, you know, underneath benches, uh, things like that. So it really just kind of is a, 
a way to kind of get ahead of things. It doesn't cure them completely, but it keeps them at a level where we really have to do very little spraying. And the acronym um, IPM, Integrated Pest Management, um, is that part of something that you also help your customers learn about? Um, how does that work if people are looking to use that at home or do you share it with other growers as, as tips for getting ahead of the pests and managing that? Yeah, certainly we've been part of, uh, you know, uh, many meetings we hosted uh, a couple of years ago before COVID hit, um, the Tri-State uh, integrated pest management uh, meeting at Estabrooks um, with, I think there was about 25 or 30 different growers there. Um, and we explained how we approach things. Um, we also take a, a proactive approach to homeowners and try to use the least toxic uh, product available to get the job done. Um, so always looking for, you know, the most effective um, and least, least um, you know, toxic in order to uh, you know take care of whatever pest, but identifying the pest first is really the, the key for a homeowner, and from there we can treat appropriately. Uh, Jennifer and Scott, do you um, have any tips that you've come upon as cut uh, flower growers and gardeners? Yeah. I mean, you're yeah, offering a, fun, a lot. <laughs> this is a fun topic. But since we're on a smaller scale, we have one greenhouse at 70 feet. Um, we have our IPM team is our ducks. We've got about a dozen ducks. They are awesome with the slugs and snails, which are common pests mm -hmm. on Iceland poppies and in dahlias and some other cut flowers. But because of our scale and the fact that we grow so many different crops in smaller amounts, we don't tend to get one pest that overtakes everything, which is one of the pluses to um, growing with such a diverse selection of flowers and crops. Um, another thing we use is like, I just purchased my second round of lace wings yesterday and they just send little eggs on a tag and you hang them from plants in the greenhouse. So if you get ahead of the pests, specifically for us, aphids is a problem in the middle of the summer around the middle of July. So if we get ahead of those now, that's on my mind, then it does not um, decimate my sweet pea crops too soon. I can kind of control that better with the beneficials. And we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of spiders. We have a lot of uh, ladybugs that have overwintered in our white farmhouse. They seem to love white houses. <laughs> and we just keep corralling them together. And, you know, somehow they live through the winter. And we just put them in the greenhouse. And um, what are those other long guys that stick? stick thing, you know? praying, mantis. Uh, praying mantis. We have praying mantis egg cases. Every winter we kind of just keep an eye on them behind our log pile. And those three, three guys together really help. Oh, and the sparrows, we've got tons of birds here and they dive bomb all spring, dive in front of our faces and just take the black flies away. It's off. It's a beautiful thing to see. Everything working, uh, coordinated together. And you know, Marie, you and I have talked about that before. That's part of the reason why you've started your business and you're the first lavender farm in Maine and that coordination, that collaboration, whether it's the plants or the people, tell us a little bit more how you've managed that on your farm, Marie. Um, we practice permaculture practices here and we've had issues with bugs. Um, one of the issues that lavender has is grasshoppers wanting to um, give urine and bring up the pH. So when we brought in uh, wild strawberries that brought in the sparrows. Um, the sparrows wiped out the grasshoppers. They actually nest in the lavender. So we show the children where they nest. Um, and that is taking care of our grasshopper issue. Um, as far as like uh, potato beetles, we had issues with that sucking on the lavender stems. Um, we brought in some lemon thyme and lemon thyme got rid of the potato beetles. So we have no issues with that at all. Now, as far as the black flies, uh, we get one week of that, but what happens right now is we have seven different varieties of dragonflies that are popping out and they're all around our heads, um, eating up all of the black flies and we're so happy right now. So along with um, bringing in plants to help manage our um, pest issues, 
Um, we bring in different varieties of plants into the lavender field, which promotes other um, soldier bugs and worker bugs. Excellent. And Signe, sounds like you all have a coordinated effort in a lot of different ways at the farm. Do you have any coordinated efforts for pest management that you all put into practice? Yeah, uh, the herbs that we grow here, we typically are, our biggest problem is uh, like the Japanese beetle on our basils. And we use a lot of rime to protect it throughout the growing season. Um, so we'll have large, large cuts that go over, over the rows that we will stake down throughout the growing season and only pull off when we go to harvest um, because we don't spray any of the herbs here. Except we have started to implement the use of neem oil, which is a MOFCA certified um, um, agent. And that's been really helpful um, in many ways, particularly towards more the uh, powdery mildew that we tend to experience in the later season, especially on a, in a dry season. We also have aphid problems on our calendula. And we've tried a lot of different things like the dishwasher soap solutions and sprays and different things that are, are organic on our um, um, in our herbs and to different like varying levels of effectiveness. And we found that the aphids don't tend to actually go on the flowers, which is the calendula, part of the calendula that we use in, in a lot of our recipes and for drying. So it becomes, and they haven't seemed to spread to a lot of other things. They really love particular species of plants. And for us uh, in our rows, it's calendula and and like others, we, we have a wide diversity of plants and herbs that we grow. And I really think that diversity helps us. So you all have mentioned several different types of bugs, several different solutions. How do you keep track of this? You've mentioned as well that you have about 10 hour work days. <laughs> Signe, how are you keeping track of this? Is, is this stuff that you have notebooks full? You just Is your mind? Um, consistently full of this information how do you how do you stay organized yeah um for me uh i definitely love the record keeping aspect of it and i am this is only my second season with as the herb garden coordinator here but i have been lucky enough to be able to have conversations with previous herb garden coordinators that have worked here as well as tapping into the immense amount of knowledge and history that uh, the shakers hold here and to be able to access that. And that's something that's unique to this farm of there is a robust legacy and history that's been recorded, uh, whether that's on paper or just word of mouth and the oral stories that come along with it. And to be able to bring back practices from 50 years ago that Brother Arnold is able to share with me that were effective at that time and implement them today is something that I think the Shaker Village uh, is unique in that sense. Um, so we've definitely rotated through ideas, asked a, asked a lot of questions of people that have been here in the past and asked a lot of questions of people like everyone everyone that's on this, this call tonight. Marie, how about you? How have you um, kept all of this information in your mind um, over the past decade or so and, and how, how did it come to be as you were figuring out what works uh, to grow great lavender in Maine? Well, um, it took a while. Our first two years, we lost over 10,000 plants. Um, and then I realized, oh, we're doing something wrong. Um, it's quite wet here in Maine and lavender does not like their feet wet. Um, they're also a shrubby uh, plant, somewhat woody, and we were put plastic underneath them and that was killing them within three years they were gone um, so it took about three to five years um, planting another 4,000 lavender to figure out that sand is very thermal for lavender it reflects back into the woody plant so that it's not wet um, and it allows it to grow very large so it's not restrained by plastic so some of our lavender is about four and five feet in diameter after about 15 years of growing, um, some of the plants will produce anywhere between 40 and 50 pounds of lavender from one plant. Um, so over the years, I realized that um, we wouldn't put any plastic under a tree. It would kill a tree. 
Um, and that is what I did, and it was killing my lavender. Um, so um, the other thing that um, I realized in the years is that once the bugs were gone and not sucking the heck out of the lavender, we were producing three times the amount of harvest. Which is key. So experience, uh, learned experience, uh, networking. Uh, Jennifer and Scott, uh, how about you? What what has been the I guess the magic touch of experience or record keeping uh, that keeps you going through the seasons? Well, first of all, we are always learning. <laughs> Every single day, there's something new we are picking up, and I'm constantly um, bouncing things off of other growers that. Um, not just flower growers, veg growers, other growers in our zone, especially. Uh, one of the things we do to keep on top of things is walking the fields first thing in the morning. So you guys were talking about the wake up time. I'm up early too. Usually it's four, although I don't want to be up that early. I'm like excited about stuff and I'm eager to go see. <laughs> Sometimes it's 345. I'm like, oh, but, <laughs> I get out there, like I sometimes I don't even take my tea with me. I just go out there a couple hours, start weeding, looking at all the crops row by row. I walk down every single row every single day in the morning. First thing, I look at what's going on, see the viability of the new transplants we've put in the day before, um, see if there's any bug activity on there and what kind of insects are on there. Um, and then once I'm indoors, like for lunch, I'll, I'll go talk with the other flower growers, especially through the Association of Specialty Cup Flower Growers. They're a wonderful group. Um, you can pay for that uh, yearly subscription, but I do that just for the camaraderie and the experience and the wealth of knowledge. Um, I also try to invite those beneficials early, so we kind of limit the problems throughout the season. There's a lot of trial and error, like you guys talked about. You know, not everything's successful. We don't spray anything. We do not spray even neem oil, no, neem oil although we're okay with it. We just haven't. Um, we take off Japanese beetles by hand and feed them to the ducks. It's like a big old slurry of <laughs> delicious protein. <laughs> it's gross. But through like trial and error, we learned, for instance, last year, our tomatoes, which was just grown for our family and our, our farm employees, they often suffer from hornworms, those gigantic, thick, like thumb-sized green worms. But I just learned last year by accident that one of the flowers I love for weddings, this beautiful bell-shaped, um, high-heat bell-shaped flower, which are pretty rare, Nicotiana, is a huge uh, hornworm attractor. So it was close to the tomatoes. Our tomatoes had zero hornworm action, and all my Nicotiana was loaded with these huge fat worms. So we're going to do that again because it took it tr attracted one of the worst pests away from our food crop and there were still plenty of usable stems on the nicotiana and the ducks will eat those too by the way so um just you know talking to other people is pretty much my first my first go-to yeah and a quick question about the nicotiana so um because the hornworms and the nicotiana and the tomatoes have all had, it sounds like you found and identified a relationship, which mm -hmm. you all have mentioned and probably have lots more experiences that you could share. But the pollinator for those plants, is it, are they possibly the same? Um, the types of moths that we see? Oh, well, actually, you brought up a really interesting thing that I was just learning a couple of years ago for the first time. So, Lisa Mason Ziegler, a uh, down south flower grower, has written this book called Cool Flowers, and she's also written a second book called Veg Vegetables Love Flowers. So I hadn't thought about this prior to our experience on this property, but vegetables flower later than early hardy annual flowers. So for growers that want early vegetables, if they can establish a planting of hardy annual flowers, and let those go to seed and not mow them down over the winter. That provides a habitat for those beneficial insects and pollinators who then turn around and pollinate those uh, vegetable flowers at a much sooner date than they would if they had to find your veg garden once you started planting after the first um, last frost. So uh, we're just seeing earlier and earlier fruits and vegetables because the pollinators are there. They're there for those flowers. And they, they live there all winter um, in the dead flower material and the dry material. So it's just a beautiful symbiotic relationship. 
and still learning all the time, which is yeah, great. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tom, so you actually, um, you have a family business, which is uh, pretty exciting. Most of you all have family businesses, but it's a little bit different. You have the growing side of things and you're pretty busy with two locations. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of record keeping uh, to keep you busy. Um, how how do you manage and recall all the information that you need to track uh, from season to season or week to week and keep it going to meet your goals? So we do a lot of scouting when we're watering um, constantly. Uh, you know, obviously it's the best time to think. <laughs> and so we're also making decisions on whether or not we need to change environment for a crop. Um, at that time when we're watering um, and making adjustments along the way. A lot of times, uh, you know, we grow upwards of, uh, we have at any one time uh, could have as many as 10,000 different varieties on property in the seven acres. So there's a tremendous amount of variety, which creates a lot of problems. Um, not that all of that is in one particular stage, but a, a lot of it really kind of comes back to, understanding and doing a crop analysis of what the plant's going to really need to do what it needs to do and kind of doing that research and then over the 30 plus years of doing this um you know you start to build trends within a crop and you start to dial it in more and more and more year after year um and i think those records really go back to understanding when you need to change temperatures when you need to maybe do preventative uh, maintenance, uh, whether it be cutting back or, you know, other mechanical type of things, and then also pest and disease control. There are very common um, trends within weather um, and within uh, the greenhouse environment that really can be challenging because of humidity and other things. So constantly looking at all of those pieces, but also within the garden center and growing of plant material um, for nurseries, there's a tremendous amount of research from suppliers. The toughest thing is having the time to actually take advantage of it. So a lot of time is spent in the off season analyzing what we did right, what we did wrong, how we can, can adjust. One thing that comes to mind was our dahlia crop. Um, for years, we would have a lot of problems with our dahlias actually going to tuber um, early and then shutting down and they would kind of look wilted and kind of not thrive most of the summer. This was specific to the fact that we were trying to grow them for memorial time frame in the darkest months of the year. So lighting that crop took away that problem completely. We had to do no fungicide, no, no issues, no spraying, no, no problems. It literally was getting the correct lighting schedule and sticking to that. So it's not only environmental, it's not only IPM, it's a combination of a multitude of different things. And it really comes down to, you know, identifying what you did right, identifying what you did wrong, and then making a plan to kind of try to, to adjust uh, year in and year out. And let's face it, agriculture is a, um, a bunch of triumphs and a whole lot of failures. That's a good way to summarize it, but I, I really like your point about identifying what you did right and what you did wrong. Um, when I talk to different growers across the state, whether they're growing herbs or flowers or, you know, really the babies, the nurseries of future plants for our homes, gardens, and communities, it's all about atten paying attention and careful attention to detail, um, which I think is really special. So along with that, I wonder if each of you could take a moment and tell me kind of what are your favorite parts about offering these products to customers is. Tom, we'll start with you. I think the big thing is we sell happiness. Um, you know, I, I, there's always a few bad apples that, you know, kind of ru could ruin your day. But it's really important to understand that, you know, what we sell is happiness. We sell beauty. You know, we sell a, a, a product that makes people's environment that much better. And if we kind of focus on that, um, you know, from a health standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, you know, we are the original green industry. 
And, you know, people can talk about green industry and wind and solar and all of that, but we are the original green industry and we continue to give back to the environment. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, we really uh, just add more than we take away. So let's go to uh, Jennifer and Scott. How about you? Like, what makes it special? What do you feel most special about? You've talked about the brides. You've talked about the ducks, the collaboration. What else? Oh, my gosh. Tom said it best. It's it's like, I mean, do you want to speak? I've said everything so far. <laughs> Actually, being able to make people stay, like Tom said, I think is is a vital part of the industry. But also... We, we provide high quality flowers at a, at a discounted price to brides who really need that. You know, they can't necessarily afford to go to a florist and spend five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. We provide a DIY solution to them. And it, seeing their faces light up is, I think, the best thing. You know, it's, it's just a real pleasure to, to know you're contributing to someone's, you know, amazing day and you're trying to make it just that much better. That's excellent. Um, Marie, I know you've done a lot of different thinking behind this and um, what makes it really what makes you motivated and what makes it special? Do you have any particulars? I do. I do. Um, lavender people are just attracted to it in general. So that's very easy. But when they get to the field and they pick it and they see the different varieties, they're quite shocked at the different smells that lavender can have or the different tastes that lavender can have. So that shocks them because they're thinking that lavender is just a general you know, plant and they all smell the same. Um, we make a lot of value added products here. People are surprised that you can make lavender jelly. Um, you can make lavender cookies and lavender lemonade. So um that um education to teach people that there is more to lavender than just smelling it um a lot of people um will come to me and tell me what um lavender is good for um a lot of people will tell me how aromatherapy helps them to sleep at night others will tell me that their children they'll put the lavender in between the pillows um, and it helps them with adhd so i'm getting all of this input um, from the benefits of lavender um, all of our products are here made it with love. Um, we range from lavender oils to lavender extracts to lavender um, facial creams, and there is nothing you can't do with lavender. Again, um, it, it's uh, very exciting to get up every morning, uh, especially after a rain, and smell that lavender first thing in the morning. It just puts a big smile on your face. Oh, that is special. You also mentioned um, when we first did our introductions, you, you've told us there's many different varieties of lavender, but you've also curated your own variety. Is that correct? Correct. Um, it took us about eight years, um, but it's here. Um, it's very hardy, and when it comes back in the spring, it's green. It's not gray. Um, and they tolerate uh, the minus 30 degrees, so we're not having to cover this particular lavender, where other lavenders are a little bit more uh, tender during the winter, so we cover and uncover until the snow comes in and allows them to sleep for the winter. Um, so this variety um, is definitely tolerant of the main wet weather <laughs> in the morning, which again, lavender, they do not like that. So how did you build out this variety? It wasn't, it wasn't magic. <laughs> it's probably a little effort on your no. part. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, um, <laughs> yeah, um, we took the best of the best of plants um, and we first started um, growing our seed. Um, but then we realized, um, you know, that it's not easy to grow in a greenhouse. So we cold stratify all of our seed outside for the winter. And in the spring, there's little lavenders. Um, and then we kept on taking the same, that same variety, using it, taking the same variety and propagating. And now we're at that point. 
Well, congratulations on that. That's definitely a couple special things. Uh, Signe, how about you? What has been a special thing that you've really enjoyed in being the herb coordinator? Yeah, I mean, I love I love being around the herbs all, all summer long and watching them, the perennials take form throughout the growing season is an incredible process. But I think my favorite aspect of being the herb growing coordinator out here is the community that uh, is fostered around that. So it is the greatest delight to welcome children into the garden and explain to them what's going on, doing taste and smell tests and all of those things that go along and seeing that brighten up their day and be able to form a connection with this place that is so unique and so historically rich. And then also to have volunteers that come back year after year after year to be able to see and ex hear their stories about their experiences in this garden is my greatest joy in this job. And I am so appreciative of the volunteer force and the community that's been fostered around the herb garden here, in addition to it being a business enterprise. So you, there's a couple different things that I um, think about. You mentioned the word volunteer. Sometimes if we're thinking about plants and growing, um, there's a term that I want to pick apart there. You also mentioned the word perennial. Uh, so for our newbies, um, like, okay, per, I'm thinking perennial. Well, what does that mean uh, for, what is, how is that different than the word annual? Um, and because you have so many volunteers, I could assume they're coming back to work on the same herbs, but dig into that, I guess, metaphor a little bit more if you would. Yeah, definitely. So when when we talk about perennials, as, as all of us are familiar with, um, they're, um, I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm with my, sorry, I'm with my director who's talking to me. I'm on a, a broadcast right now. Okay. Yeah, I'm, yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, That's okay. <laughs> Would you like us to? Yeah, I will come right back to you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Tom, you've been in the gardening world for more than a few years. Uh, tell mm -hmm. us, help us understand uh, the jargon, if you will, uh, the vocab of what's a perennial, what's an annual, um, because sometimes it can be easy to forget that. We go to the greenhouse, garden centers this time of year. If I plant an annual, will it come back in Maine this time next year? Yeah, I think, I think that struggle from a consumer standpoint is understanding hardiness zones. So here in Maine, we're at best a zone five, if not a zone four. So the the lower the number, the hardier the plant is. Okay. So um, with perennials, perennials are something that typically come back. <laughs> Doesn't always mean they do, um, depending on where you are and what type of plant it is. Annuals, I like to say, they grow themselves to death. They basically try to flower and produce as many seeds as they possibly can so the following year they can produce new plants. So they're most of your hanging baskets, your uh, pot crops, things that go into the um, and flower all summer long. A perennial is more likely to actually have one bloom cycle, maybe two, depending on what it is, but it's going to bloom set seed and then basically set seed and and kind of almost go dormant or just kind of lay low the rest of the season so um that's kind of the difference most of your trees and shrubs are all going to be perennial or hardy um you know woody plants uh but when we think of perennials it's mostly you know anything from daylilies to um you know some of the herbs to um, you know, many of, of the, uh, I mean, there's over 1200 varieties sitting in the garden center right now. So a lot of options, but you have a selective bloom time frame, So you have to have multiple varieties to get that bloom length where annuals will bloom all summer long. 
That's a helpful definition. And Signe, sounds like you're back on after taking a quick work uh, time out. Appreciate you for doing that. Uh, Tom answered our questions about differences between annuals and perennials, but uh, tell us a little bit more about the types of um, products that the volunteers are working with. I want to get back to that because you said that was pretty special. Um, are they coming back and working in basically perennial gardens or uh, particular types of herbs? Yeah, largely. Um, so our volunteers will work with all of the herbs here. Um, a lot of them are perennials and we have large perennials, perennial beds. So it's very, we have volunteers that have been here obviously longer than I have, but have been working on the same like rows of lavender that have come up, you know, every year for decades at this point. And uh, to be able to have these relationships with the same plants that are able to give to us each season is something that's really um, been a wonderful process to watch happen and to hear people um, talk about like a specific row of lavender or a specific bush of, or a section of bee balm, um, any of those things um, to hear about their connection is so intriguing and gives me so much more insight into the garden and how it operates today with me being in it. Excellent. And there's an educational component that you mentioned. Marie, you also talked about educational components, helping kids tour lavender, um, parts of your lavender farm. Tell us a little bit more about some exciting moments that uh, kids, I guess kids of all ages, learn when they do their tours. Uh, well, <clears throat> they learn how to have lavender tea because we have lavender tea potties and lavender cookies. Um, we put in um, jewelry into the lavender fields because we tell them the lavender fairy is coming. So it gets them involved into um, learning more about the different types of plants, the different um, showing the birds and the sparrows that nest in there and what they are doing for our lavender. Um, we also um, do trail walks here at the farm where we teach about herbaceous ground cover. Um, and we're also located on Big Indian Pond. So we're able to go and um, teach a lot about um, birds. And um, right now we have a red headed crane that has a baby um, down in the bog. So they're able to see that. Um, the eagle is here every day. Um, so they're able to see that. So we have a variety of different um, options for children to come here and learn more about Mother Earth. So special. Um, I would like to just take a moment uh, to touch base with our listeners. If you're just tuning in, we've been having a great discussion about all the knowledge and information that uh, Maine's farmers, growers, producers, uh, nursery, managers, do-it-all, DIY captains um, have been up to uh, this spring. And I'd love to kind of finish out a little bit here at the end and maybe talk through what do you have going on uh, for the rest of the season? So we're, we're in May, the, the trees have just burst in color with their green leaves, got a little bit of pollen moving around, uh, great flower blossoms started us out. Tom, what's on the docket between now and summer and fall? Well, obviously we're approaching Memorial Day, which, you know, typically is like the kickoff to planting in the state of Maine. But as we discussed earlier, people have been going for about three weeks now. Um, you know, there's there's been just a resurgence in gardening in general with COVID and, and people staying home. Um, the last two years, we've just seen unprecedented volume. Um, and so what does that kind of mean for us? Well, like I said, we, we planted an extra almost 10,000 plants today. We've got more product arriving weekly. Um, and it's only about three weeks and we'll plant our moms. Um, so that's kind of scary. But we're always a season ahead. So um, our poinsettias will come in July. Um, and then our early spring crops will come in October and November. So, you know, we're, we're there's a lot of work to do. Um, and certainly as the season goes, um, things are well ahead. Um, things are moving very quickly. 
So if you're a consumer out there, get out there and visit your local independent garden center or your farm. Um, product is going extremely quickly and uh, you wanna plan ahead. Um, this is not something you can just kind of think that you're just gonna walk in and get everything you want. Uh, for instance, uh, tomatoes are going extremely fast, uh, faster than we've ever seen. Um, so that's not to say we don't have crops behind it, but they're just not ready yet. Uh, by Memorial, they will be. But uh, it, it's, it's a pretty daunting uh, outlook um, with less staff than we've ever had and double the volume of business that we had last year, which was double. Um, and so it's, it's a great problem to have for this industry. Um, but it's just a daunting task with the staffing levels and the volume and the tenacious uh, purchasing by customers. It's, it's, uh, we're very fortunate. That's a good tenacity to have for sure. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Jennifer and Scott, what, it, what's it looking like for you as you prepare for the months and seasons ahead? Well, very much like Tom said, it's daunting. We've got so much to do. We just want to help everybody. We don't want to turn people away that really need that last minute wedding taken care of. So we've got 40 weddings booked. We already have uh, a third of the season booked for 2022 for weddings, which is pretty early, um, much earlier than last year's bookings. And we've got also the grocery accounts and the smaller things like the florists and designers. But uh, in just another few weeks, I'm going to start seeds again for our biennials, talking about perennials versus annuals. We also have this other category, biennials, which are like, it's a kind of a way to fool a perennial into blooming its first year. As long as it has that overwintering um, cold period, then it can start blooming in the spring as if it's the first year for us, but it really feels like the second year for the plant. So I have this whole tunnel planned out to um, start seeds for it, kind of like starting seeds for the spring, but it's in the middle of the heat. So there's a challenge there. So in addition to growing, um, harvesting and arranging for this season, as Tom said, we're planning ahead for next spring to make sure we have the volume. You know, we're only growing 10,000 tulips, which sounds like a lot, but for a small flower farm like us, that's about average 10 to 20,000. We've also got the heirloom chrysanthemums. We're doing a starting a north field full of peonies. Probably um, 800 to 1,000 bulbs are going in this October along with the tulips. Um, and this is all simultaneously with wedding design. Yeah, um, that starts in three weeks. We have three weddings in yeah. three weeks. Just <laughs> keeping an eye on the calendar there. <laughs> wedding after wedding after wedding until <laughs> the frost comes and then more weddings. <laughs> but but in, in amidst you know amidst all that we have two young daughters elementary age and my focus is always on them I'm like how can I make this a really rich experience for them to learn and feel included they're taking more and more responsibility on every day um, they've got their chicken chores and duck chores but both of them have started to grow my youngest is eight and she's starting pig breeding we're getting some pigs as well as um the veg she she seeds the veg and she's like or her name is chloe and i found out after we named her that that is greek for new shoots new life new planting uh and she that is she has lived up to her namesake and she can get anything to start. She'll pick one seed and we're Scott and I are choosing like two to three seeds and then we'll thin to make sure we have that cell full. We're not wasting, you know, table space in the greenhouse or in the germination chamber, but she'll pick that one seed and go, mom, this one's going to be it. I'm like, are you sure you don't want to do two or three? You know, no mom, this one's it. So, you know, <laughs> and she's she right. Knows. <laughs> <laughs> My other one's into the flowers and the baking and it's just, it's great. So, Amidst all the busyness, we're trying to also balance raising two girls to love the land and want to keep this going when we're gone. We really want them to, to want to be here uh, and not leave the farm like a lot of the younger generations do, but to take this on for the, their own business and see the potential. There's just a limitless potential here. Extra special. Thanks for that one. Uh, Marie, tell us what... Uh, what the next few weeks or seasons are gonna look like uh, between now and next May? Well, we started off this year, um, early April, um, teaching people how to um, take care of their grapes by um, pruning them. Um, then afterwards, we did a class on 
how to eat dandelions, which is very beneficial. Um, but unfortunately for lavender, it's a short period of time between the mid-June to mid-July that we harvest. Um, we did get a new variety called Phenomenal because we do like doing a lot of test plants here. And we're planning more of that this year because it does extend our season um, August to the end of August. And what we do with those long spikes is we make a lot of lavender wreaths. So that has been fun. That was last year. We did that for the first time. It was a hit. Um, the wreaths were absolutely beautiful. And so that uh, prompted us to plant more phenomenal to extend the season. Awesome. Gonna be busy still. <laughs> Signe, tell us a little bit about um, what you have planned between now, like I said, it's springtime, but there's still plenty of spring, summer, and even fall. Um, to do some stuff. What's on the rest of the calendar this uh, growing season and harvest seasons? Yeah, so the rest of the season is going to be right now getting the plants in the ground and then quickly in the next two weeks we're going to start our first harvest of some of our perennials. That includes uh, lovage, yarrow, thyme, um, things that are quick to come up in the spring and that'll all this will be a constant cycle throughout the harvest season uh, where we do large harvest of an herb and then we bring them up to our our large drying rooms that we that we use and they are dried and then uh, from there processed and packaged uh, into our herb tins and bulk bulk containers and so that'll be this never ending cycle that we'll be going through all growing season and then uh, attending farmers markets routinely. We're guest vendors at um, a wide variety of central and southern Maine farmers markets throughout the growing season, as well as hosting uh, workshops and volunteer events in the herb garden. Uh, having We'll have virtual workshops uh, to allow for more people to access it from all around as well as accommodate COVID uh, restrictions. So there's going to be, it's going to be a very, very busy summer and it's looking like it's going to be a great growing season. So we're just getting ready to harvest, harvest, harvest um, and go and see people out in the world at the markets and hopefully be able to host people uh, way more than we were last summer um, in our herb gardens. Excellent. Well, I do want to say thanks to some of our listeners who turn, who tuned in live. Um, I think we've got a fellow a growing enthusiast uh, just wants to thank you all, saying it's so nice to see um, all of you. And they really appreciated all the wonderful knowledge and info that you've been sharing. And we're just about out of time for this session. But I know that all of you um, will certainly be available at your businesses. You've accommodated all of us uh, tuning in and learning more about Maine plants as we've had episode two of Harvesting Maine. So please, if you're just tuning in and you're listening for the first time, do reach out. We have great ways to connect with our farmers and growers. So with that, we'll conclude our second uh, episode of Harvesting Maine. Thanks to all of our growers, our nurseries, our gardeners, and our listeners for your time here this evening. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Anne. We really Thank appreciate you. it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You can find Maine Farms and products at www.getrealmaine.com.